so we will begin the conference from now on. Please, whenever you are ready. Hello, Anyong Haseyo, and welcome to the Sweden Korea Digital Economy and Trade Forum about digital and green transformation beyond COVID-19. My name is Anna Frankson Starin, and I will be your moderator for today. I welcome all of you watching wherever you are. First of all, I would like to send out an uh, advice to all of you listening to turn off your microphones and please put them on mute. Last year, we celebrated 60 years of diplomatic relations between Sweden and Korea. And here we meet again one year later. And the world is a lot different. But one thing is for sure, it's more important than ever that we continue to have uh, prosperous relations and collaborations with other countries around the world. As humans, we have always looked into the future to prepare for what's coming. And we do so today also to find new ways to guarantee a sustainable development for a green and digital transformation beyond COVID-19. Uh, and the event today, I believe, is a little bit like that. It's about gazing into the future. Well, I am Swedish, but I have very, very dear relations to Korea. I have a lot of friends from Korea, and I learned to love Korean food when I worked for the foreign ministry in uh, during the World Expo in Seville in 1990. But you know what, just the other day, I overheard my nine-year-old son when he was singing a song called Love Scenario by a K-pop group named Icon. And you know, my nine-year-old son, he knew the Korean lyrics by heart. And I think that's amazing. And you know what, he asked me if we one day could go to Korea and meet the pop group and also he wants to see the culture that you're having there. Now, it's time for me to finally introduce our to our first host for today. And I want us to digitally travel from our studio here in Stockholm, Sweden, at Epi Center to meet our Korean co-host uh, in a studio in Seoul, in Korea. Mr. Kim Jong-ju. CEO of Kita. The stage and our st uh, screens are yours. Warmly welcome. Hello, everyone. I am CEO Kim Yong-ju of the Korea International Trade Association. In June and December of last year, we held the business summit between Stockholm and Seoul, and about a year has passed since then. A lot has changed in that one year. We are working remotely for the past several months and also import and export consultations with the buyers have been replaced with online meetings. Today, business leaders from both countries are meeting virtually. With the global pandemic, we are feeling the past approaching digital era, and we have come to realize that the threat of climate change and environmental problems are right next to us. As Swedish environmental activist Greta Thunberg put it, the eyes of all future generations are watching how the older generations are going through this period of great transformation. To answer such questions posed by the future generation, the Korea International Trade Association and Business Sweden are holding a forum on the theme of new digital landscape beyond the COVID-19. Sweden has taken the lead in sustainable growth and environmental issues by raising the topic of people's green home since the 1990s. 
Based on the principle of inclusion, innovation, and trust, the people, the government, the companies, the politics are all practicing the value of sustainability by leading the transition to digital economy and responding to climate change. Korea shares common values as Sweden and has announced digital New Deal and Green New Deal policies. The Korean government's New Deal policy is not only a strategy to secure competitiveness in the new industrial structure after the pandemic, but also an effort to actively participate and respond to the climate change. Korea is already realizing the everyday digitalization based on superb digital technology and infrastructure. Sweden is also taking the lead in accelerating the digital economy and realizing carbon neutral society led by innovative companies. If the most innovative countries, Korea and Sweden, cope with today's digital transformation and join forces to leap forward toward the sustainable society, the changes brought by the pandemic can be used as a momentum for the development of the digital and green industries. In today's digital roundtable, we'll be discussing the values and directions that companies and governments should consider as a critical elements in the post-pandemic transition period. The business leaders gathered here today represent the digital and green industries of both countries, and they are responsible for the sustainable growth more than anyone else. We hope that today's discussion will be a place to explore new possibilities and share insights on the role of government and responsible corporate management for a better future in this era of revolution. Lastly, I'd like to express my gratitude to Minister Anna Halberi and Minister Yu byung hee of Trade of Korea and also the members of the Business Sweden and also Chairman Ilba Berry and Embassy of Sweden and Ambassador of the Embassy of Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kim. From Stockholm, Sweden, I want to introduce you to our second co-host, the warmly, warmly welcome Miss Ilva Berg, CEO of Business Sweden. Thank you, Anna. Dear ministers, excellencies, business leaders, and all of you in the audience listening in, please let me repeat what my friend Mr. Kim at Kita just said. As co-organizer, I am very proud and honored to welcome you all to this first ever Korea-Sweden Digital Economic Trade Forum. Last year, we were fortunate enough to meet and celebrate long diplomatic and commercial relationship with the largest ever delegation visiting from Korea to Stockholm and the largest ever Swedish delegation visiting Korea in the late fall. I'm happy that we already this year can follow up on our deepened relationships. Korea is uh, Sweden's third largest export market in Asia, in addition to the export of 1.7 billion US dollar, more than 120 Swedish companies operate in Korea through their own legal entities, and another 500 Swedish companies conduct business in Korea via local partners. Last year's high-level exchanges between our countries saw major MOUs being signed and new collaborations being initiated. Let me give you a very brief update on just some of the concrete results from last year's meetings. Northvolt has continued expanding their EV battery capacity in the north of Sweden, and two of their Korean suppliers are in the process of establishing operation in Sweden to support and collaborate with Northvolt. Korea has also established a case startup center in Stockholm this year. The Swedish company Impact Coating has established a branch office in Korea to collaborate closer 
with Hyundai Motors for the development of hydrogen fuel cells. Scania has delivered power solutions from Sweden to be used in a large number of docent machines globally. Embracer Group has established a local presence in Korea, deepening their network with Korean partners within the gaming industry. These are only a few examples of some of the new industrial relationships that we have seen taking place between Korea and Sweden, Swedish companies during the 2020. 2020 has been an exceptionally difficult year. We're all trying to find our bearings in a global economy struck by the COVID-19 pandemic in a time when also climate change is on top of the agenda. In September, I was impressed and happy to learn about Korea's New Deal initiative, which is focusing on green and digital transformation. It is a very impressive and interesting plan for not only recovery in the aftermath of COVID-19, but it is also about building sustainable competitiveness in a new business landscape. I, of course, hope that the K-New Deal will provide many more opportunities for Korean and Swedish companies to collaborate. And I guess that that is what we will learn more about today, among other things. So again, a big welcome to everyone participating and listening in. With that, I hand over to our moderator, Anna. Thank you, Ms. Ilva Berg. Uh, now it is time for us to leave the floor to Korean Minister for Trade, Jo Moon Ji, for welcoming remarks. Good afternoon. Good morning. I am Minister Yu Myung Hee for Trade. First of all, I sincerely congratulate the successful opening of the Sweden-Korea Digital Trade Forum to promote digital economic cooperation between the two countries amid COVID-19. I want to thank CEO Kim young joo of Kita and Chairman Ilba Berry of Business Sweden for organizing this meaningful event. My special gratitude goes to Minister of Trade Anna Halberry, who shared the view that strengthening of digital cooperation between the two countries are critical at the bilateral trade ministers meeting last June. Thank you, Minister, for your support. In addition, I'd like to express my gratitude to all the companies from both countries who are attending, despite the fact that it is held virtually. Business leaders, with a prolonged COVID-19 pandemic, economic activities continue to dwindle. Anxiety about when it will end is spreading widely, while our lives a rapidly transformed toward the digital economy. Just like today's forum is conducted virtually, we are getting used to doing things online or remotely. Digital-related business such as online shopping, telemedicines are rapidly growing. And also, the online business have doubled. Digital transformation is accelerating not only in daily consumption but also in production activity. Companies are significantly increasing their investment in smart manufacturing systems that incorporate cutting-edge technology such as artificial intelligence and big data to drive productivity and supply chain innovation. Global distribution is no exception. Once again, we have advanced digital trade. However, if you look at, unfortunately, the current WTO agreements or FTAs have limitation in promoting digital trade or allowing free flow of data across borders. As a result of operating different digital norms, companies around the world are faced with unexpected expenses and sometimes getting involved in trade disputes. In addition, it is difficult to accumulate and utilize data due to the differences in the pr perspective and protections of the personal information rather than focus focusing on close communication and cooperation. We need to establish new international norms that can properly address digital co commerce. Currently, more than 80 member states, including Sweden and Korea, are participating in the WTO e-commerce negotiation. We look forward to reaching a satisfactory result. Business leaders, 
There is a tremendous potential for digital cooperation as both countries have world-leading companies in the area such as 5G distribution scheme in ICT infrastructure. I hope the exchanges and cooperation between the two countries will further activate it, leading to results such as joint ventures and joint research. Particularly, startups are leading player in the digital economy, and Korea Startup Center was opened in Stockholm in July this year, so I look forward to the promotion of cooperation among startups. Two governments will also actively support cooperation between companies. To secure safe data flow and exchanges, we will endeavor to obtain Korea's approval of EU's general data protection regulation, and we will also make most of the EU-Korea high-level digital consultative mechanism. In addition, as Sweden and Korea are like-minded countries that support multilateralism, we will closely cooperate to successfully conclude the WTO e-commerce negotiation and will actively cooperate in the standardization of digital technology. Sweden and Korea have taken a big leap in mutual trust through mutual visit between the leaders and have consolidated our ties as we experience the pandemic. In addition, innovation activities in both countries are always at the top of the Bloomberg Innovation Index. The transition to the digital economy is accelerated by the fourth industrial revolution, and COVID-19 is an irreversible irre trend. If a new challenge for all of us, if we, the two countries, work together and cooperate based on trust, we can definitely turn challenge into opportunity. Congratulations once again to the successful of today's event, and I wish you health and happiness. Thank you, and takso mike. Thank you, uh, Minister Jo Munji, for those words, and a special thank you for, for the thank you in Swedish. Our next speaker is the Swedish Minister of Foreign Trade, Anna Halberg. The screen is yours. Thank you. And um, dear minister, uh, business leaders, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, first of all, I would like to extend my thanks to, to South Korea and my colleague, Trade Minister Yo, for taking the initiative to the inaugural of the Korean Sweden Digital Economy and Trade Forum and invited me to co-host it. Last year, Sweden and South Korea, as we heard in the introduction, celebrated 60 years of diplomatic relations. Since then, our bilateral relations have taken on a fantastic momentum which we have upheld despite the challenges posed by the ongoing pandemic. In fact, it's only fitting that the two of the world's most innovative and open countries can connect like this digitally across the world. As I speak to you today, I can't help but be optimistic about the opportunity to build back better together and to a transition to a more resilient and inclusive and sustainable society. In December last year, some of the representatives here today, uh, for the organizations here today, we met in Seoul uh, to discuss digitalization and 5G at a round table hosted by the Swedish Prime Minister. It became, it became quite clear then that the fourth industrial revolution, revolution had already arrived, 5G, and artificial intelligence will disrupt our entire per perception of industrial production, healthcare, communication, and transports. Since then, COVID-19 has only accelerated this process. The virtual world has partly emerged as an obvious alternative, or may I send, may say more of a complement to the physical world. In this respect, I'm very eager to follow the Korean Startup Center in Stockholm and the opportunities this will offer for Swedish-Korean co-creation within the target areas, AI, health tech, fintech, gaming. The climate crisis poses a challenge for us all. And luckily, many advanced economies have decided to do their part in halting it. Both Korea and Sweden, as well as the EU, have adopted ambitious climate goals. And I was indeed so pleased to hear President Moon announce South Korea's 
2050 goal of climate neutrality. I'm also impressed by the Korean Green New Deal and its investments in sustainability. Sweden too has high ambitions. Our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2045. It's not easy, but we are well on our way and our success would not be possible without the drive of the Swedish business community. Friends from the Swedish industry, correct me if I'm wrong, but I note a decisive mindset shift within the Swedish business sector over the last decades, where private actors used to see costs and challenges, they now see competitiveness and profits. The success of our Swedish companies testifies the fact that it is not only possible to go green, it's absolutely profitable. The private sector in Sweden also drives innovation through significant investments in research. There is a close-knit cooperation and mobility between universities and industry. I consider the companies present here today as a model in this respect. This year we have seen the new Swedish companies entering and investing in the Korean market. This is really great news. I was also happy to learn that the growing number of Korean companies are showing interest in investing in Sweden. Potential sectors in include everything from hydrogen, battery, to life science, fintech, gaming. Sweden might seem far away, but we offer a competitive environment which stimulates innovation and co-creation, of course. Finally, I can hardly imagine two other countries being better equipped to lead the twin transition to better societies. These challenges cannot be dealt with by any country alone. I would like to encourage more Swedish companies to seek opportunities in South Korea, as well as more Korean companies, of course, to consider Sweden and the Nordics for your growth. Sweden is, and will indeed be, a true partner to South Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Anna Helberg, for your special remarks. Now it is time to listen to Mr. Kim Pan Yung, Congressman and Head of Korea New Deal. The screen is yours. I'm very pleased to meet you. I am floor leader Kim Taehyung of the Democratic Party. First of all, congratulations to the opening of Sweden-Korea Digital Trade Forum. I'd like to express my deep gratitude to the Korean International Trade Association and Business Sweden officials for preparing a very meaningful forum at this time when cooperation and solidarity among countries become more important than ever before due to the COVID-19. Sweden is a country where economic growth and environmental protection can coexist. It is an exemplary nation in responding to the climate crisis around the world. The Korean government has announced the Korean version of New Deal and is preparing for a transition to green economy. The Korean version of New Deal is a national development strategy to become a leading country in the world order that will change in the post-COVID-19. Sweden and Korea are optimal partners in that they are preparing for the post-COVID era based on solid manufacturing base and innovative companies. I hope today's Sweden and Korea digital trade forum will serve as a valuable opportunity to confirm the possibility of new economic cooperation between the two countries in the era of digital transformation. As the floor leader, leader of the ruling party and chairman of Key Deal Transformation Committee, I will pay special interest and efforts. Thank you. Takso Mike. So, Mike, thank you, Mr. Kim Tan Young. Today, we have the opportunity, all of us, to listen to amazing keynote speakers, well known representatives from Swedish and Korean industry. First, a warm welcome to Mr. Marcus Wallenberg, Chairman of SCB. Thank you, Anna. Uh, honorable Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. In December last year, I was invited by Business Sweden in Seoul 
uh, to talk about the Swedish corporate outlook of Korea. On that occasion, I argue that uh, Korea and Sweden share a history of economic development through industry and innovation, and that if we work much better together on these issues for tomorrow, we will have a bright shared future as well. I'm grateful for this opportunity to readdress the topic because the importance of Swedish-Korean cooperation has only grown since last December. Let me share a few thoughts of the challenges that the COVID pandemic has brought to trade and innovation and report on some progress that may further strengthen the Swedish-Korean cooperation going forward. So the first challenge is connected to fighting the direct effects of COVID to people directly health and well-being. Korea was one of the first countries affected by COVID and has served as an inspiring model for utilizing technology and testing to manage the situation. It would be interesting to learn from the Korean experience, and I'm glad that Prime Minister Levin and President Moon Jae-in has already initiated such an exchange. I'm also happy to note that the letter of intent between AstraZeneca, SK, Bioscience and the Korean Ministry of Health and Welfare was signed in June of this year to manufacture AstraZeneca's potential COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, by the way, I had a positive outcome this morning in Korea and a vital capacity to global supply chain. This will be an important pillar in AstraZeneca's uh, COVID-19 strategy. The second challenge has to do with the geopolitical effects. The COVID pandemic amplified many of the trends already pres uh, present and that we in business deal with, namely protectionism, geopolitical tension, and the risk of technology decoupling. These trends did, however, not arrive with the COVID pandemic. This is important to stress because COVID tends to be used as a pretext for quite intrusive interventions in the global economy. In Europe, for example, there is currently a debate on how to create more resilience in global supply chains by focusing on strategic autonomy and reshoring. I'm in this context more impressed by the newly finalized trade deal, RCEP, between China, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Korea, alongside members of the ASEAN. This openness to international trade is exactly what is needed, needed today to recover economically and to strengthen supply and value chains. I would urge both Sweden and Korea to continue to stay open to the global economy and to champion the free trade agenda. The third challenge has to do with the effects on global competition and how COVID could be the catalyst for innovation, not least in relationship to digitization and sustainability. In this new era of sharpened global competition, I am convinced that innovation will be rewarded. We are all impressed by the Koreans' investment in R&D and continue to climb well above the 4% of GDP and which we hope that Sweden will follow suit at some point. I'm equally con convinced that digitization and sustainability are two trends that will drive innovation going forward. These two elements will also reinforce each, uh, each other. From a board perspective, sustainability is a way to future-proofing competitiveness. There's a huge long-term business potential if you get ahead of the rest of your competitors. Furthermore, the private sector has a major role to play in the green transition. Companies are the, are the engines of innovation and technological development is one of the central elements of this transformation. Sweden and Korea are well positioned to take a lead and should work together to strengthen cooperation in these two areas. Whether it's about smart cities that ABB and many others address or green financing those who move early and can find the market actually has the chance to win. The fact that we, through Ericsson and Samsung, are uh, deeply involved in the 5G technology speaks to our country's advantages. 5G will be a program for innovation, both in digitization and sustainability. And I'm happy to note that the 6G discussions have already started in Korea and that Ericsson is an active part of that. Another positive example is connected to the importance of entrepreneurs, which was earlier um, mentioned here with the Korea Startup Center um, in, in Stockholm. 
And we are now in discussion with the KC how to support their activities through uh, one of our family's holding companies, FAM. Yet another example that can be found in the field of life science and biomedicine, which I believe is a key innovation sector for both our countries. AstraZeneca has announced a major new manufacturing partnership with Samsung Biologics, valued of about $550 million. Korean biomedical sector has it rises to prominence in this uh, very important field going forward. So finally, I'm happy to note that Korea, much like the European Union, has through its major investment program in identified digitization and sustainability, which speaks for even further and deeper collaboration. So summarizing, if anything, COVID-19 pandemic has taught us how, the in, how interdependent and vulnerable we actually are across the globe. To tackle the challenges of our time, I believe in increased international collaboration, innovation, future-oriented investments, not the least in the field of digitization and sustainability. Sweden and Korea are well positioned to be at the forefront of those transformations as individual countries, but even more so together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marcus Wallenberg. We will meet you again in a short while during our roundtable discussions. Now, uh, our second keynote of today is Dr. Cha Moon Jun, CEO of Samsung Economic Research Institute. Warmly welcome. Our screens are yours. Good afternoon, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to deliver a speech at this prestigious forum. I have no doubt that there will be many productive exchanges between our respective countries as we discuss ways to collaborate in this digital era. Of course, nowadays, one of the topics always on our mind is COVID-19 and the profound changes it has brought to Samsung, Korea, and world. <coughs> According to one study, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> According to one study, behaviors repeated more than 66 days become habits that we take for granted. <coughs> With nearly one year spent in social distancing, we are well on our way to treating COVID-19 as an inevitable part of life. <coughs> Among the many new habits we have acquired, the ones that leverage digital technology will likely persist even after the development of vaccine due to their greater convenience and efficiency. COVID-19 truly has redefined many aspects of Korean people's lives. In our own business, Samsung Electronics 280,000 workers in 73 countries now routinely use virtual meetings and work outside their office. Thanks to these remote solutions, employees can work wherever they need to. I'm sure that other Korean firms have explored similar solutions. As for home life, like people in other countries, Koreans have cut down on time spent in restaurants and stores while spending more time and performance, more, performing more activities at home. Home fitness, meal kit delivery, and video streaming services all experienced rapid growth after the outbreak. On a public health front, Korea successfully managed the outbreak of COVID-19 by leveraging its strengths in ICT technology and infrastructure. These include mandatory electronic digital logging systems, real-time mapping and alerts on new infections, and rapid testing for virus. In its education system, Korea was forced to rapidly replace in-person classes with online real-time lectures. In less than a year, the millennia-old tradition of gathering and receiving instruction from teachers was obliterated. Even among all these changes, and despite the language barrier, Korea's culture industry, including music, TV programs, films, 
continue to thrive. K-pop stars like BTS and Blackpink drew new fans through their YouTube channels and online concerts. Ladies and gentlemen, now coming back to Samsung, I would like to discuss how we are preparing for the post-pandemic era. Samsung is sparing no expense in developing the product that will define our future. Key to this product innovations and digital transformation is continued progress in four major technological building blocks. They include AI, 5 and 6G network connectivity, IoT solutions, and cloud computing. In other words, they are to collect, store, and analyze data and to facilitate all of this process. <clears throat> In AI, we have Bixby, the voice-controlled AI platform, and we are also exploring artificial human platform called Neon, whose avatars respond to users with realistic facial expression and actions. In semiconductors, Samsung is pioneering on-device AI solutions and AI chips with neural processing units. In network connectivity, Samsung is leading 5G network expansion by developing and commercializing 5G solutions. Samsung is also actively pursuing 6G research through its Advanced Communication Research Center, which published a white paper on 6G this past July. We also have invested in home IoT products and services for consumers. At the same time, we are building a more connected world through smart cars and smart factories. Finally, in cloud computing, Samsung is developing low-power, high-performance memory for data centers. Replacing existing memory with our new technology worldwide could save about 7 terawatt hours of energy every year. This is about similar to the growth in Sweden's electricity generation in 2019. Distinguished guest, Samsung is using these technologies to develop devices and solutions that anticipate and satisfy people's needs. In particular, we are focused on four trends that COVID-19 has made clear. Physical to digital, machines for human, the stay-at-home economy, and the environment. The Samsung's product in line with this trend include smartphones, wearable devices, cutting-edge TVs, and home appliances, among many. They are ushering consumers in new digital lifestyles and enabling them to personalize their digital home in new ways. On top of that, Samsung is contributing to global environmental efforts by releasing power-efficient appliances like the Grande AI dryer and energy-saving home solutions from SmartThings. To conclude, I firmly believe that human society has evolved and advanced with the increasing mobility of resources, people, and goods. The outbreak of COVID-19, however, has dealt a sudden blow to mobility worldwide. Despite this, COVID-19 will never harm the universal tendency toward expanding creativity, friendship, hospitality, and the growing exchange of information and knowledge. I would like to point out that this forum we are holding today is a prime exchange of overcoming limitations of mobility by COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, Samsung prioritizes mutual development in all of its communities. In particular, with a digital divide worsening under COVID-19, Samsung is making even more effort to help resolve this issue through R&D and innovations as well as CSR activities. I hope that we can use this forum to share ideas that benefit the global communities and pursue opportunities for collaborations 
especially for the two countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cha Mu Yu. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank all speakers in this first session. A special thank you to Ms. Minister Yu Mun Ji and Minister Anna Halbei, and thank you, Mr. Kim Tan Yu. Now it is time for us to move along in our agenda to the next part of our program. And I have the extreme pleasure to invite all of you to listen to our roundtable discussion on our theme, Digital and Green Transformation Beyond COVID-19. Now, as the world recovers from the health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to reshape our common future, as we are on the path to more resilient and sustainable and green world beyond the pandemic. Being here today is a step towards collaborations with that aim. With us, we have an eminent panel with participants from Sweden and Korea. We have our two keynote speakers with us, but also from Sweden, let me introduce you to Mr. Mats Pellberg Sharp, Head of Sustainability at Ericsson. From Embracer Group, Mrs. Kiki Valjelund, Chairman of the Board. From Northvolt, Mrs. Emma Nedenheim, Chief Environmental Officer. And from Business Sweden, Mrs. Ulva Bay, CEO. From Korea, let me introduce you to Samsung Electronics, Mr. Kim Bong Chong, Executive Vice President. From Smilegate, Mr. Yang Donkey, President. From LG Chemicals, Ms. Chung Inyi, Sustainability Expert Advisor. And from Moti, Mr. Song Yuho, European uh, Trade Division Director. And from Kita, Mr. Kim Jong Ju, CEO. So I would like to start with a question to Mr. Marcus Wallenberg. The coronavirus pandemic is a humanitarian crisis that continues to take a tragic toll on people's lives. But undeniably, COVID-19 has also acted as a catalyst for change on a scale not seen since wartime. What are the major changes and technological leaps, Mr. Marcus Wallenberg? Thank you, Anna. Well, of course, there are so many impacts of this tragic pandemic uh, that we're seeing. But uh, if I look upon it from the point of view of different industries, I'm not going to be going through everything that, that we see on this side. But of course, uh, in financing, you can see absolute tremendous change uh, in two aspects. One is the, the digitization moving away from physical banking for example, into more digital. So in this part of the world, we have long been having a situation where if you're a bank customer, you want to see that you can do your transactions 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that continues. But I think it during this COVID crisis, it accelerated even more uh, in a quite dramatic way, which you have been able to see now uh, when you look at companies like Ant Financial, uh, and, and similar companies that are, are plowing ahead at a very high speed. But let me take another side of it, and that is um, the pharmaceutical industry, where I think uh, the, it's unprecedented speed at which so many vaccine candidates have actually come about. Uh, I mean, research into this started in I would say, in, 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 uh, at least in Europe and the United States, uh, around January, February. And already today, we have a number of vaccines which are, you could say, are, are possible to see as, as uh, taking steps into becoming authorized to be uh, used by large patient groups. I don't think you've ever seen that kind of speed ever in developing a new medication. and. Uh, so there are a number of things that are moving very, very fast. Then on the other side of the table, yes, if you're in entertainment or travel, it's of course a terribly difficult side. Let me stop there. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next question I would like to direct to Mr. Kim Bon Pyong. Now, why is digital education important in the age of COVID-19? What's the role of the ICT companies in digital education? Uh, Do you hear me well? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Kim. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you. Actually, because of the COVID-19, we are seeing many changes, and there are two major changes. Like you said, digital transformation. And another one is the importance of ESG and raising awareness of ESG, especially like previous speaker Mr. Cha said, Samsung is working on many fields to build digital infrastructure, and we have benefited by it for ourselves as well. So we thought that while seeing this kind of benefits of digital transformation, we thought that whether this transformation could be sustainable or not, so what should we do to make it sustainable? The ans one of the answers we found was digital education because I believe that now the digital is a great part of our daily life and given that the digital related benefits must be shared equally across the country, I believe. However, that is not the case in reality. In many cases, we are seeing deep digital divide and because of this divide, some are taking advantage of it and some are not. So Samsung Electronics and other ICT technologies realize that in order to minimize such a gap, we need to intervene. And that's why my company is paying much attention to the digital education, and we are doing a lot of relevant activities. In case of Sweden, because of COVID-19, for areas were hit hardest, and you are providing many discrete devices for online education and providing mentoring services for them, and it was well received by those four regions I heard. And those kind of activities must be duplicated across the globe so that we can narrow down the district as much as we can, and that's the main focus of us as well. Thank you very much. Now, global economy is in crisis. When do you think that we will recover from the coronavirus recession? Mr. Kim Jong-ju from Kita. Recently, COVID-19 is spreading again, spiking again, and all of us are deeply worried about it. Ever since COVID-19 broke out, of course, quarantine is critical, but also all of our economic activities have been stagnant, and countries around the world were very active in coming up with physical and financial policies to normalize their economies. However, compared to the previous year, we expect to achieve minus 4 to 5 percent of the growth rate. That is actually a retraction. And also, if you look at the trade volume, it is uh, likely to reach around minus 9 percent level. So that is the prediction of the international organization. Then, when will we be able to put a break on this? When can we recover the economy? I guess that depends on when can we actually put a total stop in the COVID-19 spread. Considering the development of the status of the vaccines and treatments and also the cure therapy of the COVID-19, considering the timing of that, well, if I say in a positive note, probably sometime around the second half of next year, the global economy is likely to be recovered in a tangible way. However, the, there must be a premises. International cooperation in the healthcare area must be established first. And in terms of the global trade, we need to restore multilateral trade and also free trade 
system and also the global supply chain needs to be restored. And that kind of efforts must be made. Thank you. Thank you. And my next question, so uh, I want to direct to Mr. Song Yu Ho from Moti. In what way do you think that digitalization and innovation will drive the post pandemic era? Well, just like the theme of today, which is the COVID-19, I believe that our daily lives will definitely become greener and more digitalized. COVID-19 enables us to work at home and also purchase product online. But in a way, if you look at the productivity, once again, you can surprisingly find out the productivity has increased and if things are more efficient. Of course, the economy has contracted, but air quality has given us a better life. And the mountain Himalaya, at the top of that, is actually visible. So as we experience COVID-19, our society is achieving more sustainable livelihood or life. And to do that, we need to pursue green economy and also digital economy. So we have to make most of the AI and 5G technology innovation. All of these will give us a new boost and also advanced the digital era that we expect. Encountering with the digital technology, the product will be smarter, the service will definitely be improved, and consumption will also increase. IoT, big data, those technology will also gain when they are applied to the production site. The greenhouse gas emission will be reduced, and also the energy consumption will become much more efficient. On the base of that, we will be able to achieve more sustainable growth. Therefore, countries around the world need to prepare for the post-COVID-19. And as a keywords, green economy, digital economy are the keywords. Last July, Korean government has also announced Green New Deal, and new and the Green New Deal has once again focused on creating new jobs and making more environmental friendly policies. Around 16 trillion. 160 trillion Korean won will be invested in the Digital Green New Deal. I sincerely hope that Sweden and Korea can work together to develop our technology and also exchange our human resources. Thank you. Thank you. Now, my next question I want to direct to Ms. Kiki Van Yerlund. COVID-19 have severely restricted every global travel over these last months. Still many prefer face-to-face -face meetings, but there is something we can learn from the gaming industry, I believe, when creating new meeting formats in response to the pandemic. The screen is your Kiki. Thank you, Anna. Yes, absolutely, we can learn from the gaming industry. Because if you think about it, gaming is a social experience and we play games together. Meetings are happening in games all the time. And the gaming industry has already created interactive multiplayer experiences. And there are millions of players that interact in multiplayer online games every day. Now, all these games are, of course, designed to encourage interactions among players. And just the competence and experience that all these game developers have gathered uh, around the user experience in this area could actually help a lot to create the software that will be needed for new meeting formats. And, it, and if we, on top of that, add the VR technology that has been developed for gaming, then it will make the experience to meet and share even more profound, I think. So if we really have a desire to find new online meeting formats that are almost identical from sharing a physical space and like real face-to-face -face meetings from, uh, we would have a lot in common with the, with the video game. And that is what makes me believe that we will really be able to learn a lot from the gaming industry. I got actually from, uh, I was, uh, Smiling this morning, I got an email from one of our from my colleagues in the U.S. He's representing the young generation in the U.S. and in our studio there. He said there is plenty to get upset about with COVID life, 
but the uh, but just the thinking of what all the opportunities we have excites me how far how much further we can do and kiki we are a gaming company we have the power to add a lot of value into new meeting formats Thank you, uh, Mrs. Valjelund. Now, my next question I would like to direct to Mrs. Emma Nierenheim from Northwold. There's been a debate in media about what the COVID-19 crisis means for the transition to sustainability and green. What is your perspective on this? Well, of course, I mean, a crisis like this, uh, we've talked about the climate cr uh, change crisis for a long time. We've seen that our ability to be prepared is uh, uh, still too slow. I think that this crisis has uh, taught us that we can we can be uh, prepared. We need to prepare for for more drastic change than I think we thought we would. I think that in times like this, we also learn that uh, uh, distanced relationships uh, require closer relationships. So. Uh, now more than ever we need stronger relationships so that first when we need to work on distance and also when we need to solve even bigger crises ahead of us we need to be even more uh, communicative we need to be even more uh, understanding each other uh, across the uh, across the borders and i think we need to spend even more time getting to know what kind of readiness we need to have, uh, both in terms of becoming more digital, as has been mentioned several times here, but also the people that need to travel need to do it safe and need to do it effectively, because we see a lot uh, across these few months that uh, we need to bring people here. We need to bring a lot of people here from Korea and the rest of Asia. And uh, for those we prioritize, we need to find safe and good ways of doing that. So to find a good balance between how the world travel will continue in a sustainable way and also finding good alternatives in the digital form, I think is very important going forward. But also, as I said, being, being ready for an even bigger crisis that lies ahead of us, I think is incredibly important learning. Thank you, Ms. Nerenheim. Now, the next question I would like to direct to Mr. Kim Wong-kyung. How do you think that the transition to green sustainability will be affected by the COVID-19 crisis? At the early stage of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had an interest in ESG, but we thought that people's interest in ESG will shrink because of the COVID-19. Because when they cope with the economic issues, ESG issues might be seen as kind of less important issue, we thought. So we had a concern. But it turns out that actually it was the opposite. Because of the COVID-19, people really realized what truly important for them. For example, we did a customer survey and it turns out that more people are preferred to buy eco-friendly products 10% more than before statistically. So these interests for greener lifestyle will make the government and companies to pay more attention to newer and more ESGs. So we have a good motive to have further interest in ESG. In case of Samsung Electronics, we are seeing the climate change and to cope with the climate change by 2050 in the US and in the EU, we will use a renewable energy 100% and that promise was made in 2008. And now we are almost end of 2020 and we do believe that we'll be able to make good on our promise. That is very good news. Also, other ESG-related initiatives are being actively engaged by Samsung Electronics, and we will work harder to show you better ESG activities. Thank you. 
My next question I would like to direct to Mr. Mats Pellbeck at Ericsson. Now, what role will digitalization play for the future sustainable and green society? Well, uh, thank you for that question. It's uh, an honor to be here. And I think that digitalization will be absolutely crucial for, for how we can cope with, with the new green crisis uh, or the uh, climate crisis. Uh, digitalization will impact all different sectors. And, and even if the, uh, the I ICT sector is one and a half percent of the global carbon footprint, it can affect 15% in other sectors. So in smart transport, in buildings, and in energy and all other sectors like agriculture and so on. Uh, and I think one of the early areas that we will see uh, is really a convergence between a digital infrastructure with the electricity grid uh, and the transport infrastructure as uh, we will see electrification of transport. So I think that that is one of the key areas to, to look on going forward for, for digitalization and for uh, the electricity grid. Thank you, Mr. Pellbeck. Now, my next question I would like to direct to Ms. Chung Inyi. Uh, how can we assure and ensure that the transformation of societies will be sustainable and green transformations? How can companies not only maintain but increase business growth and reduce the climate footprint at the same time? Thank you for the question, moderator. Um, it's a very important question that we all face at the moment. Um, the great thing is that we do have a global pillar of direction. Uh, we have the Paris Agreement for Climate Action, and we have the uh, 20, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So we have that global uh, milestone that we have there. Uh, it's great to know that a lot of countries are going um, climate neutral by 2045 for, for Sweden and for 20, uh, 2050 for Korea. And, um, and this is a great milestone as well. Uh, so I think it's, there's no one size fits all. The, the whole global community has to sort of go towards this uh, direction. And, and for a company like LG Chem, a very, um, dare I say, carbon intensive industry, a manufacturing sector, um, the whole sustainability and carbon neutrality debate is a challenging uh, aspect. But at the same time, I think we're really looking at this as an opportunity to, to, to have it as a, a core of the business uh, strategy. So uh, recently, um, in, in July, LG Chem has announced uh, going climate neutral growth by 2050. So that's actually uh, maintaining our carbon uh, di dioxide emission levels to uh, 10, 10 million tons, uh, which is 2019 level. So that's a huge commitment from, from a chemical industry like LG Chem. And so how are we trying to address this issue? Well, uh, there are several facets. I think the, the easiest or maybe the, the important thing is reducing the carbon emissions as much as possible. And we're trying to do that by increasing our energy efficiency in the manufacturing facilities and also seeing how we can you know, s switch the fuel content as, as to carbon lean as much as possible. At the same time, like Samsung, uh, we're trying to see how we can uh, use renewable energy to manufacture through RE100 uh, campaign. Um, I think we are trying to do that for our overseas plant at the moment, but increasingly with the right environment in Korea, we're looking to um, going RE100 in Korea as well. Um, so there are some mul multiple areas where I think LG Chemical is trying to, to pursue. Another area is really using this as a business opportunity, making new climate-friendly, environmentally-friendly products. Uh, for example, we are trying to, um, it's, it's still in the R&D phase, but we're trying to uh, manufacture some biodegradable bioplastics, for example. Plastics become a huge issue globally, so we're trying to see how we can be the solution and not the problem. So there are multiple areas where I think companies can really take action and be the solution. That's great. Now, a way to reach a sustainable development and a sustainable future is often spelled electrification. That is the heart of Northwolf's uh, business idea. So what are the challenges we have to meet to go electric in a sustainable way? This is Emma Nierenheim. Oh, there are uh, many, many challenges related to that. Thank you, Anna, for the question. I, I think that as an industrial actor in this area, I mean, we have taken the steps necessary in order to move on this early market 
So we have placed our high energy production in, in an area in Sweden where there is a surplus of renewable energy. And, and do it, by doing so, we're bringing down the carbon footprint of the Northvolt batteries to uh, almost zero for every part that is produced within the factory. And we have also added scale, we've added vertical integration, so we do more than any other battery factory do under one roof. But having said that, we also have to realize that that is a good solution for the momentum that we want to create right now. But if we want to expand this industry and if we want to meet the market demands, especially here in Europe, but I would say globally, we have to be ready in, in all areas. So we have to prepare for uh, feeding the grids with renewable carbon free sources of energy uh, all across the planet. And we need to uh, expand uh, the electricity grid so we can transmit and uh, distribute uh, clean uh, power to all uh, parts of this new industry that is being built. And, and I mean, we cannot uh, forget that it's a huge demand out there and the end customer is very, very uh, picky uh, in terms of the compromises that we as a new base industry uh, in electrification, how, how uh, big, how much we can fail, so to say. So we have to be very, very careful with everything we do at this point and all the choices we make uh, in order to meet the end customer demands on the market. And I really, really want to stress that the electricity grid, so the ESS market needs support because this is a, this is a regulated market. Uh, you need uh, long lead times in order to build new grid solutions. It needs to come with a new kind of digitalization, so it needs to be coordinated. And this is an area where I think we see a lot of challenges if we do not push the development um, by far. I see batteries here as well, but it's also about um, infrastructure uh, development a lot. Yes, thank you. And in the regards to that, I know that there is a general concern around electrification and digitalization. And one of the concerns is regarding that the energy supplies are scarce and that the digital transformation and new IT systems will demand uh, an increased energy supply in a speed that where we are afraid we cannot keep up. What do you think, Mr. Mr. Max Pelbeck? Yeah, I think there is a concern, but I think it's a bit overestimated because uh, we have done research in Ericsson. We are a very technical company and we've done life cycle assessment and research on, on the energy for, for, for the electric, uh, the energy for, for the ICT sector over many years. And in fact, since 2010, uh, between 2010 and 2015, there was no rise at all of, of the carbon footprint from the sector while the energy rose a couple of percent. And why is that important? Yes, it's important because that's what, when we built 4G and in the mobile network, there was a significant increase of energy, but that was absorbed by other sectors going, other parts of the sector going down. And what we see now is, is really that we need to build 5G without increase. So we have called this uh, uh, breaking the energy curve for the mobile networks. And, and we have worked very much with our Korean uh, uh, customers and with others to improve that. So we have reduced energy consumption in the 5G network through the standard, and we have developed a model on how we can build the network uh, without increasing energy consumption while building 5G. So I think that there is an, an, uh, a bit of over concern over the energy of the, this sector. And, and we are using, we, our footprint is one and a half percent of the global footprint. So it is low and it will remain on, on that level. And we are also one of the biggest buyers of renewable energy in the world, in fact. Uh, so so uh, as an industry, we are starting with ourselves. We have uh, worked as a, together with, with ITU, the International Telecom Union and GSMA, and set targets on a one and a half degree trajectory. So there are already targets for all our customers to work with, and then we support them with, with uh, energy efficient solutions and, and AI solutions, software that save energy, and also it's very important to modernize the network. So we are, as, as Ericsson, we are driving this very much, but of course we start with ourselves. So we set the target on ourselves to be carbon neutral by 2030 for our own operations. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, all of these uh, investments are, are, well, it's demanding investments, this transformation. So what do you think are the major investments that needs to be done to accelerate the transition to green? And I would like to address Mrs. Chang in He. Thank you for the question. Um, as you said, I think there are a lot of uh, areas for investment for a, a rapid uh, and accelerated green transition. Uh, it's quite encouraging, actually, that the financial sector is looking at this seriously. Ha getting the whole financial sector to move towards that direction, I think, is a very, very good way forward. But from a, just a, a traditional um, investment area, I, I have two, po two areas. One is the energy sector. Uh, so this energy uh, has to be in a way that uh, the green transition has to be, you know, enables. For example, um, if if the if the energy system is not diversified in a country, uh, then that might be a hurdle for certain companies and uh, especially the industries to to go greener. Um, another sector I would mention is the urban uh, infrastructure sector, the urban uh, the urban development sector. Uh, smart cities is, is an area that has been already mentioned, but this is where also sustainability and digitalization can be actually converge. Um, urban infrastructure is very important because we are now churning out uh, e-vehicles e, uh, and e-buses, etc. But if there are no charging stations to actually cater for that, which you know, has a huge investment uh, a cost, then that, that will be a, another hurdle. So I think two areas, energy supply and maybe urban infrastructure will be the area where uh, uh, investment focus could, could be done. And this is where also the government can play a, a very critical role in really pushing this forward. Thank you. Now, the gaming industry is one of the fast growing, most fast growing industries in the world. Is there something that other industries can learn from them since they have been digitalized from the very start? And I would like to address Mr. Yang Dong Ki. Well, the rapid growth of the gaming industry continues together with the technology development. And once again, they are providing new forms of enjoyment. During the last 100 years, the most rapid growth was witnessed in the content business like movies. In case of movies, they provide different form of enjoyment like showing them music and images, a totally different kind of the enjoyment. Therefore, the movie has grown into the largest content industry. In case of game, not only they utilize the cinematic delivery, but also the game industries gives us opportunity, a new experience of participating in collaborations and competition with other people while directly manipulating the charters. Watch movie and playing games. These two are probably the most obvious words to show these differences. And also, in terms of the technological area, if you look at the history of game industry, in early age, Nintendo was the most representative one, but through the era of PC and Internet combination, we are entering into an era where the mobile devices and wireless network are converged into one, and they are adapting to the new kinds of technology that is continuously evolving. As such, by applying new technologies and new content delivery methods of games, we constantly provide new forms of enjoyment that we have not experienced before, and we believe that the game industry will grow and will continue to grow in the future as well. That is my belief. Thank you. Mr. Marcus Wallenberg, what role will the, will the financial sector play in the transformation to a sustainable future? And what business opportunities do you see in a future green economy? Uh -huh. uh, well, let me uh, put it uh, this way. I think that the first and foremost uh, trend uh, coming into the financial uh, sector is that uh, regulation will change quite rapidly in terms of uh, adding cost of capital and cost of liquidity for the financial sector that's, uh, that, that will finance non-sustainable 
projects or not non-sustainable assets in the future. And this will have wide implications uh, in my mind uh, because um, you will find that the banking industry around the globe will move at a rather fast pace towards uh, future-proofing their lending book going forward. So I think that the regulators have played a big role here in shaping the thinking of the, of the financial industry uh, going forward. The, the most obvious uh, investment areas will be uh, green infrastructure in various forms. Uh, and um, I also think that since we're talking Sweden, Korea, uh, with our great positioning in uh, 5G, uh, 5G will be a technology which will help various industries to reach customers with a huge amount of data very, very closely. And it will provide, for example, the opportunity to create uh, more smart cities with uh, driving driverless cars, uh, battery technology will be probably much more provided as we've heard earlier today. So I think that um, the, the, the large infrastructure plays, uh, if supported by governments in conjunction with the financial industry, will have a substantial effect on the uh, transitioning, a combination actually of digitization and sustainability. And uh, there, in all this lies a great opportunity in my mind. Thank you. Well, uh, I would like to, when talking about investments, I have one further question for you, Mr. Marcus Wallenberg. From the Knut and Alice Wallenberg mm -hmm. Foundation, I know that you are investing a lot into life science and data-driven life science. Can you just explain a little bit and tell us a little bit about the, uh, these projects? Well, one, we, we touched earlier upon the possibility of uh, uh, this time around that in the vaccine development of the vaccine, uh, it will really uh, be helpful. Well, we have come to the conclusion that maybe one of the key aspects uh, in developing new molecules in various forms, either for uh, biomedicine or for traditional pharmaceuticals, the, uh, uh, the possibility to utilize computational power and the, comp the development of computational power actually gives scientists a huge possibility to move into new technologies and finding new drugs uh, to support the unmet uh, needs in terms of, uh, of pharmaceuticals uh, in various forms going forward. Uh, but to do that, you will need uh, to invest quite dramatically into using AI and big data uh, in the future to support scientific communities. So therefore we came to the conclusion that one of the aspects that we could support Swedish uh, development uh, on the research side here uh, would be in uh, adding to previous um, uh, foundation research projects, uh, not only in life, traditional life science and sequencing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also in addition to that, uh, uh, adding the component of driving computational power as a key part of that research. So this is really the whole thing. It will be a 10 year program uh, and it's starting right away. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, you mentioned on the subject of investments, you mentioned in your keynote speech that Samsung is investing a lot of money and efforts into developing AI technologies. Dr. Cha Moon Yoon, can you explain a little bit further? Thank you. Well, as a company that seeks to solve real world problems, Samsung is focusing on developing innovative products and services by leveraging AI technologies. Uh, by doing this, we hope that uh, we can provide values and uh, benefits to people and communities. To this end, we think that human resource is the most important factor in the advancement of AI. 
So we are exerting strenuous effort to recruit and retaining outstanding AI talent from all over the world. Of course, we are very focused on creating the environment that ensure this talent can thrive. But however, because AI has so much potential, Samsung also regards global cooperation as critical to the development of AI research and technology. Currently, we maintain six global collaborative research centers around the world. So no sunset in Samsung's AI research. And we also understand that the inorganic approach in AI research is very important. And therefore, rather than competing global companies in AI, uh, we are interested in building more collaborative and productive relationship with them, both for AI research and enhancing the applicability of research output. Naturally, we hope to expand our collaborative AI research with Sweden and I hope this forum can be an opportunity to advance toward this goal. Thank you. Thank you. When we're talking about sustainable development, and I believe we need to talk about taking a sustainable responsibility, and that means being sustainable in everything along the entire production chain. How do you ensure that sustainability is in the core of your business strategy? Mrs. Emma Nierenheim. Well, uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, all the way from when we started Northvolt, uh, we understood that in order to create uh, this momentum on this European market that was significantly lagging behind in terms of battery production, we would have to ensure that we could create trust in this matter. And that trust meaning uh, that there would be a, a zero tolerance towards ethical uh, risks along the supply chain, but also that we would have um, significantly better traceability across the supply chain uh, than what we had seen before. Uh, the battery industry had been a little bit criticized or questioned uh, from what we saw, and we wanted to uh, we wanted to explore the opportunities uh, within the supply chain to, to uh, de-risk, especially the unknowns. So to really understand and to be able to explain what has happened. And uh, uh, acknowledgement to Samsung that when we started already had been acknowledged by the, uh, by the community for, for having a transparent uh, supply chain. Um, as you know, we brought more into the Northvolt uh, production in terms of materials. Uh, but we have now, today, we have developed a strategy uh, over these past three years that includes buying minerals directly from the mine. So uh, making sure that we know exactly where every element is coming from. And also we're building a circular economy. If there is one part where it really makes sense to have circularity, it's with uh, battery production, because uh, we know that the batteries will reach end of life. They will have to be recycled. Uh, and we also know that uh, the, the absolute majority of the material in a battery is elements. So it's metal elements, and they can, by definition, be recycled uh, back to, its, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, virgin form. So that means it's, uh, or elementary form. So that means it's, a, it's actually a very good and, and prosperous pr process to recycle in a fully circular flow and also to create a, a, an economical value from that. So these are the two strategies, buying very far upstream, uh, controlling the entire supply chain, adding uh, our a connected battery model to it. So 100% traceability, 100% content declaration. And uh, we will declare the carbon footprint and the recyclable content of each of the battery cells that we produce. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the strategy. And that's also 
something that I think at least on the European market is going to be a hard requirement uh, from especially the end customer point of view. Mm, thank you. Now, in the age of untagged or contact free, virtual worlds rise as alternatives to physical world. Notably, gaming industry is seen as untapped solutions for human connection and entertainment. Plus, even recommended by the World Health Organization. What role does content industry take in the untapped era, Mr. Yang Dongki? We live a tightly connected life around the world, but the reality was rapidly cut off by the COVID-19. In order to overcome this confusion, restoration of the connection is necessary, and the answer will be restored by connection through virtual world. And right now, I believe that the most promising platform for the, this role is gaming industry. I'll give an example. Last April, Fortnite is a game name, and there is a singer called Travis Scott who did a concert, and more than 27 million people watched it. I mean, it was surprising to have a concert in the game, but also Abata uh, was wearing a Nike shoes which attracted attention around the world and produced a tremendous marketing promotion effect. In addition, with the, within the virtual world, there was some virtual exhibitions and the meetings. All of these were possible, so we are restoring the connection with reality. This was possible because, unlike other online platforms, game industry or game itself requires real-time interactions among the participants. That is the essence of the game. And also because the key elements of the game of the enjoyment is added when there is a real-time interactions. Therefore, people are very much voluntarily taking part in the restorations of the connections. So for the time being, I believe the game will continue to play important social role called restorations of contactless era connection. Thank you. And to succeed with all this, one important, important question to many organizations is about attracting the right workforce and, and perhaps especially young talents. Being a globalized market, how should leaders attract the coming generation of employees, do you think? This is Kiki Van Yellen. Thank you, Anna. Yes, uh, within the Embrace group, we have different nationalities from more than 45 countries. And I talk to them and I meet with them all the time, and uh, especially with the younger generation of our employees. Now, uh, considering that they are all having different perspectives and different, I mean, different cultures, I'm quite amazed actually by how to hear that they're all saying the same thing when I ask them this kind of question, regardless from where they are. I mean, it's very, very clear uh, that they all take pride in their work and they want to work for a company that they that work for, that will be good. I mean, the, a sustainable company, because according to them, that is very important because it will make them feel proud to work for a prestigious uh, organization that is admired for its sustainability. And uh, they also say that that will imply that the company not only cares for themselves, but also for the well-being of a greater society. And they talk a lot about community involvement and volunteering initiatives that are implemented everywhere, actually. But there is one thing that they say, and that is that the company they work for has to have a strong belief in diversity. It shouldn't matter from who you are, where you come from, what you look like, or they actually also say, say they always add, or what games you love. Uh, so I think um, uh, what they, to conclude, they talk also about work-life balance. They talk about how uh, 
to be have, be able to have a remote work that is uh, more accessible and available. That is something they all talk about, and uh, uh, they all have the same views. And I think this to work for a sustainable company is extremely high up on the agenda for everyone. I think the challenge, though, that I've been thinking about is that. Uh, it's important for us to have the veterans in our companies to actually understand and accept what the new generation would expect from us in this area. Thank you. Thank you. The increase in cross-border transfer of data is promoting the digital globalization in the 21st century. Do you think we are equipped with the relevant digital trade norms? What do you think are the uh, key factors to consider when establishing new international norms? Mr. Song Yuho from Hockey. As you are well aware of, WTO was launched in 1995. At that time, was just the initial stage of the Internet era, and e-commerce concept was unfamiliar. Therefore, WTO norms needs to be expanded, needs to address digital e-commerce. And once again, WTO has its own limitation. Therefore, the members of the WTO understand revisions and would Modifications of the WTO norms, and we are having the digital e-commerce negotiation. There are things that we need to consider. Let me address two points. First, the fair market order needs to be established. When a good product, good services are launched in order to facilitate that, indiscriminatory measures must be taken and fair playing field must be provided. The second one is a free flow of the data and that should be in balance with the privacy protections. The data must flow freely, but at the same time, privacy needs to be protected, which means the infringement of the personal information should never happen. However, there are some differences in the Privacy Information Act, and we need to harmonize them. In case of Korean government, in relations with the data protection clause, we need to get away from excessive protection, but at the same time, we need to recognize the privacy protection, and we have modified our act and regulation. If you look at the level of the privacy information, it's similar to that of the GDPR of the EU. Currently, EU's GDPR appropriateness is currently ongoing, and within this year, we plan to approve that so that in doing the digital business, Korea would like to have a much better positions or, or much balanced position with the EU. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're getting near the end of this fantastic discussion. and. I would like for you to sum the day up a little bit. And my question would be, if you got to visualize the future of the relation between Korea and Sweden, what would that look like? And I first address Mr. Kim Jong-yu, CEO of Kika. Uh, Sweden and Korea geographically very distant. It's end to end. Although geographically we are far away, we have had a long relationship. We are very grateful for the things that Sweden has done to us about 120 years ago. Exactly speaking, it was in 1896. Ericsson installed Korea's first telephone for the imperial family. And also in 1950, during the Korean War, Sweden dispatched medical support group from far away. And also the first ever Korea's modernized medical center, which is called right now as a national medical center, Sweden actually helped us and Swedish medical support group helped us to establish national medical center. More recently, outstanding the world renowned companies are doing business in Korea, Volvo, IKEA, 
AstraZeneca, Ericsson, SAF, all those 120 Swedish world-renowned leading companies are doing business in Korea successfully. And as Minister Anna Halbe mentioned, more Swedish companies are planning to advance into Korea. And also Korean companies are planning to advance into Sweden, I hope. And on top of such exchange, as you know, last year we have celebrated the 60th anniversary of the diplomatic relations and leaders of both countries have held a business summit and they have agreed to have a business meeting. They have held a business summit between Seoul and Stockholm actually twice a year. The leaders of two countries met more than two times in one year. So they met in, in Seoul and Stockholm twice, the leaders of two countries. That is a very special cooperative relation. It once again shows that two countries have the commonality a lot of room for enhancing the cooperative ties. At the times, leaders of Sweden and Korea have reached agreement in various sectors. For example, in the area of science and technology, they agreed to collaborate further. And in the area of the health care, they decide to strengthen public-private partnership. As a result of that, as the uh, head of the Palem has mentioned, the vaccine development SK Chemical will carry out a consignment development with AstraZeneca and SK Chemical and also the startup, which is actually the main body that pursue innovation. And as you know, we have established and opened a startup center. So as you can see, Starting from last year, collaborative ties between the two countries have taken a full speed, especially in Korea. As you know, sorry, in case of Sweden, as you know, the growth and environmental protection, we have this perception that these two can never coexist, but Sweden made it possible. And also the welfare and the growth can never coexist, but Sweden showed that all of these are possible. Sweden is a country that maintained all of these possible, but at the same time has achieved a drastic development. That means that we need to learn a lot from Sweden. Sweden is an exemplary nation, especially the digital innovations and in Green Deal area is a new direction, but both countries have the same policy. So when we collaborate, I'm sure that we can definitely achieve a great growth. So not only in the economic sectors and industrial sectors, but we need to enhance our collaboration in the area of the climate, culture, education. I sincerely hope that we can pursue and develop our collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kim. And finally, I would like to ask the exact same question, Mrs. Ilva Bay. If you got to visualize the future of the relations between our two countries, Korea and Sweden, what would it look like? Thanks, Anna. Well, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for the very good collaboration that we already see between our two countries, governments, but also truly the, uh, the relationship uh, that has developed so nicely between our business lives and the uh, uh, companies and uh, the witnesses that we have heard here today. But uh, when I look uh, into the future, I believe in uh, free trade and I believe in the importance of uh, global investments as well. And uh, Business Sweden, we have actually during the last uh, six months mapped uh, the largest, the 358 largest uh, critical situation uh, when it comes to the challenges that the climate is facing globally. And we realize, looking at these uh, critical climate situations, that most of them can actually be resolved by technologies, savvy technologies, digitalization, and collaboration. And I believe that uh, the strengths that Korea and Sweden have exhibited for such a long time, and uh, how we are complementing each other, I believe that we could uh, even deepen our collaboration uh, in, the, in the future by 
collaborating around resolving some of these big climate challenges that we see with known technologies. And that is a challenge that I give to ourselves, to, uh, to Mr. Kim and myself, but also to our government and to our business lives to in a focused and target oriented way, see what we can do about them to create even more global trade and more investments and thereby resolving the biggest challenges that the world is facing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ilra Berg. It's been an absolute pleasure to listen to all of you. And I have to round this uh, round table up, unfortunately. Also, listening to you made me feel very, very hopeful that there is a bright future beyond the pan uh, pandemic. And first of all, we would, of course, like to thank every single one of you participating for being a part of this round table discussion and especially for all of your sincere answers. Thank you very much. We would also like to thank all of you who have been with us today and in listening to us today. And I have to say that I'm really looking forward to see all of you once again in a year to see what we all have accomplished. But until then, I only want to say thank you and stay safe and come sa hanida. Thank you and share the love, share the love. See you soon.